Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is a project I've been thinking about and working on for a couple of years, and this is the first time I'm presenting it at a conference, and I'm excited and nervous, and I really appreciate your interest. Um, if you're watching this at home, thank you so much for watching this video. I watched tons of these NDC videos myself. Um, so uh, before I start, there is, if this wouldn't work, oh, I got it, there we go. Um, you've seen this uh, disclaimer on Twitter and whatever else, like I need to kind of double down on it before I start because yes, I work for GitHub and yes, I'm talking about source control, but this is a side project. This is a personal project. I'm not announcing anything on behalf of GitHub today at all. Don't get me in trouble. And uh, my friend here is watching you, so don't, don't get it wrong. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, you know, a lot of these uh, kind of tech presentations, they're either product presentations where it's about here's what the product does, and then there's philosophy of presentations, and then there's code presentations. I'm going to do a little bit of all three. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's important to be working on source control right now. Uh, I'm going to talk about, of course, Grace and what I've done with it, and talk about the architecture of it, do a little demo. Uh, and then I'm going to talk, so that's a good product part, then I'm going to talk philosophy about why I chose F Sharp and why I love it, it's my favorite language. Uh, and then we're going to look at some code at the end and, and hopefully it'll all make sense. So, why on earth am I doing a source control system? I mean, Git has won, right? Like, what's wrong with me? Uh, like, n with all due respect to Git's honorable competitors, like, Git has wiped the floor with everyone. And, you know, we all use it by default. It handles almost every source control scenario, like large files are a problem, as you probably know. Um, I think Git won because its branching mechanics are really brilliant compared to the, the, old, the older other source control systems in the past. Um, the lightweight branches are great. Um, I love the ephemeral working directory in Git. Of course, GitHub is a big part of why Git won. And you know, Linus Torvalds, I've heard he's famous. Uh, so that clearly had part of it. Um, and and you know, in, in terms of doing a new source control system, I, I, have to, uh, uh, I have to talk about some of the things I don't like about Git. Um, so I have to say some mean things about Git on the next slide. But before I do, um, I just want to really clearly say how much I respect Git and how much I respect its maintainers. I'm privileged to be at GitHub and to know some of the, some of the core maintainers of Git, and they are brilliant engineers. Like I, you know, one day I hope to grow up and be half as good as they are. They do world-changing engineering. They're super professional. They're, I mean, they're just amazing. Their blog posts, if you ever want to read the stuff from Taylor Blau and Derek Stoley at the, on the GitHub blog, they're like mandatory reading. They're great. I, I really deeply respect Git. Um, however, <laughs> Git has terrible UX. Just absolutely. <laughs> Terrible, <laughs> terrible, no good, horrible, yeah. It's designed by a kernel developer. Like, I don't want my UX designed by a kernel developer ever. Uh, I mean, like, I, I, my, my second programming language when I was 11 uh, was 6502 assembler. Like, I've done three kinds of assembler. Like, I get it. I, I love being down to the metal. It's super interesting, but I don't want them designing my UX. And, and really, Git was designed for 2005s computing conditions, which was, you know, much lower bandwidth on networks, smaller computers, smaller disks, smaller networks, and, and like, we don't have those constraints anymore. We all have, if you're here at NDC, if you're watching this video, odds are you have abundant bandwidth, abundant disk space, you have connection to the cloud. A lot of us can't even do our jobs without an internet connection anymore. So, you know, things have moved on. I, I also, I mean, there's tons of research on how confusing Git is, but what I really want to what I kind of pound the table on is that we need to stop blaming users for not understanding Git. Git is really hard to understand. Um, there's this really interesting quote from this research paper from Google from, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Um, uh, even one of the more experienced Git users requested that someone else perform an operation because, quote, it scares the shit out of me. So, like, that's Git. Um, it's not just me saying this, by the way. Um, Mark Rasinovich is a pretty smart guy. Git is the bane of my development process. So, so being smart is not the ticket out of understanding it, right? Um, 
<laughs> an incantation known only to the Git wizards who share their spells. Um, you know who else knows Git is hard? GitHub. This is what you see when you go to download GitHub Desktop. Focus on what matters instead of fighting with Git. So we know. Um, here's some interesting questions from Quora. This is like from a year ago I was doing this research. And some of these questions are kind of funny, like, why is Git so hard to learn? What makes you hate Git? Is Git poorly designed? Uh, uh, Git is awful. That's plain enough. But uh, you know, I think they're funny. I mean, th there's pain in these questions, too, which I really feel. But this one, this one broke my heart. If I think Git is too hard to learn, does it mean that I don't have the potential to be a developer? And and I just like imagine some young person who's just getting started messing around with some JavaScript or Python or something, and they're, and they're thinking, wow, like, I think I could do this. Like, this seems fun. And then someone hands them Git. <laughs> and, and they go, what, what, am I, what is this? You know? And, and like, like, we deserve better. Like, we need to do better. And, um, and instead of complaining about it, I've decided to devote pretty much all my free time for the last couple of years to doing something. Um, I also just want to point out that we're in an industry where everything changes. Like nothing lasts forever. And Git right now is so dominant that it's hard to imagine something new coming along and replacing it. But if we don't imagine it, we can't get there. Um, I just want to say that we're driven by trends just as much as we are by good technology. And um, I've had a little bit of an education on trend analysis. I'm, I'm very lucky. My, um, my, my partner was a fashion designer, was a clothing designer, and, um, and her job for 15 years was to think about what women would want to wear a year and a half, two years from now. Have really to think about what women would want to feel like a year and a half, two years from now, and then design clothes for it. And she was very successful. She's very good at it. And just in like the conversations over all the years we've been together, I've, um, I've picked up a few things. I've picked up that perspective. She's still way better at it than I'll ever be. Um, and, you know, some of our trends have shorter cycles, like web UI frameworks, right? They come and go every six months or whatever. I mean, it's stabilized now, but, um, and some are longer. Like, you know, for 20 years, I think, when you said the word database, what you meant was relational database. And now there's key value, there's document, there's, you know, I mean, really with Hadoop, we got MapReduce. So, like, things, things do change. Um, most importantly, no product that's ever gotten to 90% has just like gotten there and stayed there forever. Um, Git is currently, according to the Stack Overflow developer survey, there should be a new developer survey coming out in about a month or so. Um, Git's at 93.9%, and um, something with UX that bad is not going to be the thing that breaks the trend. Like, Git is going to go. So. There will be source control after Git. Like, there will be. Um, and what I want to say about it is that it won't be like Git++. I've had this discussion a lot over the last couple of years. Well, can't you put another layer on top of Git? Can't you maybe use Git as a back end and put a new front end on it? Like, that's been tried a number of times over the last many years. And none of them have gotten any market share. So I feel like people, once you go through the um, challenge of learning Git, you don't want to re-challenge yourself by learning something else just to use the thing you already know. Um, and I want to say adding features to Git won't prevent Git from being replaced. It's not about, well, if Git makes some changes, it'll extend its lifespan. It just it won't. It's too late for that. Um, I do think that whatever replaces Git will have to be cloud native because, oh, look, it's 2023. Um, and I think the thing that, that, that will attract users to use the new thing is that it has to have features that Git doesn't have or Git can't have. And I've tried to build some. Um, OK, let's talk about Grace. Um, source control that's easy and helpful. Imagine that. That's really what I've tried to do. My North Star from the first evening that I was sitting on my porch dreaming during pandemic, during lockdown, just sitting on my front porch thinking about it, I thought, how can I make something super easy? Something that actually, my inspiration, believe it or not, was the OneDrive sync client. And if, if you, like, the OneDrive sync client used to be problematic a few years ago. It's like really starting about three, four years ago. It's been great. It's like rock solid. It just works. 
I really like it. And you substitute Dropbox, iCloud, whatever you want. But like those things just work. They're easy. They sync. I, so I was thinking about like how do I get stuff off my machine onto the, into the cloud. So anyway, Grace has features that make being a developer easier. Not just source control, but try things that try to make your life easier every day. And it feels lightweight and automatic. That's what I'm mostly going for. Um, it hopefully reduces merge conflicts, which in Grace you'll see are called promotion conflicts. And yes, of course, it's cloud native, thanks to Dapper. So let's just talk about the basic usage real quick. I'm going to show you lots of pictures and demos. Um, I'll show you a short demo. So the first thing is Grace Watch. And Grace Watch, you can think of that as like the thing that runs in the system tray in Windows in the lower right-hand corner. Or on a Mac, it runs at that, with that little icon near the clock. So just a background process that watches your working directory for any changes. And every time you save a file, it uploads that file to the cloud to the repo and marks it as a save so that you get a full new version of the repo, like in a new root directory version with a new computed SHA every single time you save a file. And it's just automatic. It just works in the background. I'll show you uh, some detailed examples of that. Um, aside from that background process, the, the sort of main commands you're going to see are grace save. Save is that thing that Grace Watch is going to run to upload after every save on disk. Um, checkpoint and commit. So in Git, Commit is an overloaded concept, right? Commit means I'm partially done, like git commit minus m, I'm done with part one of the PR, I'm done with part two, and then you do a final git commit, I'm ready for the PR. And then we have this debate about do we squash, right? There's no squashing in Grace, you don't need to. Checkpoint is, the, is that intermediate step, and that's just for you. It's for you to mark your own time. Uh, it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't affect anyone else. But you can mark this version is this, this version is that. And because of that, we can do some cool things I'll talk about later. Um, there is a grace commit. Of course, commit is a candidate for merge or what I call promotion. And eventually, when you're ready to promote, you do a grace promote. I'm going to show you how the branching works in a little bit. There's also, of course, a grace tag, which is just a label. If you want to label a particular version, like this is version three of our production code. So those five things, save, checkpoint, commit, promote, and tag are what I call a reference. And a reference in Grace is something that just points to a specific root version of the repo. And those root versions just come and come and go. Of course, there's other commands. You need a status, Grace switch to switch branches, Grace refs to list the references that you've been working on, all your saves and checkpoints and commits. You can list just your checkpoints and just your commits and whatever. There's, of course, a diff. There's a rebase. There's going to be a grace share command. Grace share is kind of interesting because it'll, I haven't written it yet. Some of this stuff I'm talking about, I haven't written yet. This is an early alpha. Just to be clear, I should have said that. It's an early alpha. Um, it it kind of works. Um, um, but grace share is this idea where like I'm working on my code, I have a problem, and I might want to you know get in chat with a team member and go, hey, could you look at this code for me? And you type grace share, and it'll spit out a command line that you can just copy and paste and give to that person. And because with Grace, everything's automatically uploaded and the status of your repo is always saved, you don't ever need to stash. And you can just literally take that command, paste it, hit enter, and now your version of the repo is exactly the one that your teammate was working on. And when you're ready, you just do Grace switch back to your own branch. So that's the kind of workflow I'm trying to enable. Um, a quick like general overview. So locally with Grace, Grace Watch, I said, you know, is this background is a file system watcher that watches your directory. Um, switching branches is really fast and lightweight. I love that about Git. I kept it. Um, of course, like I have a doc grace grace directory, like a dot git directory, and I have objects in it and con config and stuff. So that's the local side. Your working directory is still totally ephemeral. Um, grace server is actually just a web API. There's nothing fancy, there's no special tightly packed binary protocols. Um, it's just a web API. You can code against it, too. Um, I use Dapper, if you're familiar with Dapper, to enable it to run on any cloud or any uh, infrastructure. Um, and because if you're, everyone's running Grace Watch, and you don't have to run Grace Watch, but you really want to, um, the server kind of has a real-time view of what everyone's up to. And that enables some really interesting features to be built. Um, there is, because everything that happens in Grace is an event, that gets saved, um, it immediately gives you an eventing model that you can automate from. And I just want to say the system is written almost entirely in F-sharp. Um, and I'll talk about that, of course. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait just a damn minute. You're uploading every save. That seems like a lot. 
And the answer is, yeah, but we don't keep them for very long. Unless you specifically checkpoint or commit or promote, your saves after, like by default, I'm starting with seven days. I don't know if that's the right number. Maybe it's three, maybe it's 30, whatever it is, we'll figure it out and it's gonna be settable in the repo. But like let's say seven days, we just delete the saves. So they're there for you to look back on when you want to, and then they just go away. Um, commits and promotions are kept forever, and, and that sort of like gets me to thinking, what features can we build? Well, one thing I wanted to build was, if you've used like Mac Backup, the time machine, and that, that interface, that was sort of an inspiration I had in my head. I'm not gonna quite do design it like that, but this idea where you can just go back and look at the, the, the diffs of the changes that you've made, and hopefully, do some cool stuff like reload state in your mind faster. You know, that is that their often quoted number of, it takes 18 minutes to reload state in your head after an interruption. Well, like what if we could use source control to get that down to two minutes where you could just quickly just leaf through the one, leaf through them and go, oh, I see, I see, I see what I was doing. Um, can also do cool stuff like if the server can see what everyone's doing and it sees that Alice is working in a particular file and Bob is working in the same file right now, well, that's a possible conflict. So we can notify both of them in real time and go, hey, your teammate is working in the same file. Maybe you wanna, here's, here's a link to look at the version that your teammate's changing. Maybe it's in a totally different part of the file you don't care about. Maybe it's in the same part and now you get on chat and talk about it before, before you get to a conflict when you think you're done with your work. Like, I hate merge conflicts. I hate them so much, right? Um, I'm sure I'm alone in that. Um, another thing we can do is when there's a promotion to main, um, I can auto rebase everyone in the repo immediately on that new version. So, um, and you'll see that that's super important in the way Grace's branching is designed, but it happens within seconds. Um, so what is the branching uh, model? I call it single step branching. And the idea is that like Git, I mean, there's these, um, versions of the repo and they have a particular SHA value and, and all of the you know, commits and labels and git just point to a particular version. Well, that's what I do with Grace. Um, a promotion is just a new reference, a database record in other words, just a new database record that points to the same root directory that your commit pointed to. So I do Grace commit minus M, I'm ready to promote. And then I do Grace promote to main and all, all that I do, when, when you do grace promote, all it does is it creates a database record. That's all it does, because the files are already uploaded, you already did a commit. Um, a child branch cannot promote to the parent branch unless it's based on the latest promotion. So that prevents a lot of conflict. So let me just show you a little bit about what that looks like. Um, here is a diagram that I have. Oops, no, not that this. Uh, here's my repo. Um, by the way, I want stars. I want lots of stars. I want all the stars. If you're watching this at home, I want all the stars. Um, star the repo. It's the only way I can let people know. So here's a, here's a little document I have on my branching strategy. Um, I'm going to show you four quick pictures just to walk you through really quick. Here's Alice and Bob. Uh, when they're not busy if you're, if you're into physics, you know, you see Alice and Bob a lot when they're not busy holding two entangled particles at improbably large distances. They're working on a repo together. Um, and here's, uh, here's like they're starting, it's in, it's in good shape. Main is this particular SHA value, right? It's this EDF, 3F, whatever, and uh, ED, 3F. And Alice and Bob are both based on that version. Everything's cool. Now, their SHA values are different because they're, they're updating different files. Alice is updating her files. Bob is updating his files but they're both doing their thing. Okay, now Alice makes one more change, runs some tests and goes, cool, I'm ready to promote. So she types grace commit minus M, I'm done with my PR, and then she types grace promote minus M, I'm promoting. And that now, uh, of course her files are already uploaded because she did the commit. That creates a new database record uh, on the main branch that points to that particular version of the repo. Um, so now, after she does that, let's assume that it's successful. We now are in this state where Alice is based on the version that she just promoted, because in fact, in fact, she's identical to the version she just promoted, because she just promoted it. But Bob is still based on the previous version of main. So that means that for the moment, Bob can't promote. Poor Bob. However, heroically, Grace Watch comes to the rescue. 
Um, that's so hacky, I'm sorry. Um, but Grace Watch gets a notification that a promotion has happened and immediately auto rebases Bob within seconds. So if, as long as there are no conflicts, if you know, the files that, are cha that have changed aren't the ones that he's changed, within seconds those new versions get downloaded. Um, Bob, Bob's branch is marked as now being rebased on the latest version in main, and a new save is created because now on Bob's branch he has the files that he was changing plus whatever ones just came down from the promotion. So now, after that's done, Bob has a new SHA value, which indicates the files he's changed plus the ones that were in the promotion. Alice, at this point, of course, has the same exact SHA value as main because literally she just committed and promoted. So that's branching in Grace. It's really simple. Um, it's as simple as I could possibly make it, mostly because like, I'm not that bright. I mean, why make it hard on myself, right? Um, uh, but really, it's simple to understand. So that is a little bit about branching. Let's go back to the deck. So let's talk about, I'm going to show you some, some pictures of how, how this works in, from the server's point of view. So in the server, let's just say that I, uh, I'm working on my branch, and I these dots are directories in a structure, right, in a, in a repo. And I, let's say I save a file on this, uh, this thing over here, yeah. Um, let's say I save a file in this bottom one. Um, Grace Watch sees it. It uploads that version of the file to object storage, and it creates two new, it has to compute new SHA values for those two directories. So I create what I call a directory version. Um, I upload those to the server, the server double checks them, and now we have a save reference that's pointing to this brand new version of the repo that doesn't exist in anyone else's branch. Cool. At the same time, my teammate Mia is working and she saves a file in that directory, that bottom directory. Uh, that file gets uploaded. Those three now versions, three directory versions are computed all the way up to the root. They got uploaded to the server and double checked. Now she runs some tests and goes, cool, I like this version, I'm going to checkpoint it. So at this time she does checkpoint, all it does is it creates a database record because there's nothing to upload, it's all already uploaded. So that takes about a second. Um, I've really tried to make a lot of the gestures despite the fact that um, there is always a network hop involved in Grace. I've tried to make them as fast as I possibly could and to, I've aimed for that sort of one second timing. Um, there are things that Git, because when Git does local stuff, there's things that Git is just going to be super fast at that I kind of can't compete at if there's a network hop, but there's things that I can be faster than Git that involve the network. So anyway, so here's me again. I save a file down there. It, this time it's four directory versions that get recomputed and get uploaded. Cool. Now uh, my teammate Lorenzo saves a file in that directory. Um, file gets uploaded. There's three directory versions, and he likes it. He's going to commit it and is thinking about promoting it. Meanwhile, Mia is working. She saves that file in this bottom orange directory. She likes it. She commits it. She runs tests. Everything's cool. And she actually does a grace promote. So she does grace commit. Now she does grace promote. Now there's a reference pointing to that same exact root SHA. Now we have three references pointing at the same exact directory version. One of them is on main. Two of them are on Mia's branch. And in fact, we like it so much, we're going to put a label on it and say, this is our new production version 4.2. Cool. So what do we have from that? We have five different versions of the repo and 10 references pointing at those five versions. Cool. OK. Seven days later, right? I said we keep saves for seven days or so, and then we get rid of them. Well, let's see how that works. So here's my save that I did. These are the same five, five things that we just saw. Well, the save gets deleted. OK. Well, now the root directory says, I don't have anything pointing at me anymore. It checks and it starts a recursive process to go down and check if there's anything that was unique to that version that doesn't appear anywhere else, and deletes it. So that version is now gone. Now remember, Mia did a save and a checkpoint. Well, we delete the save reference, but the checkpoint's still there, so this version of the repo stays. Cool, here's me again. I did that save. I didn't do anything else with it. Save gets deleted. That version goes away. Uh, here's Lorenzo. Again, save goes away, but the commit's still there, so this version of the repo is still there. And now we had this one. Uh, again, the save gets deleted, but we still have three references pointing at that version of the directory. But like, let's imagine that, that the, the branch gets deleted, Mia's branch gets deleted. 
No problem, we still have references pointing to that from the main branch. So now after seven days, we now have three versions of the repo and five references pointing at it. And, and really, like, the thing is, saves are really gonna be like 25 to one, right? I don't know, I'm making up a number. It depends on your workflow, but you're gonna have like 25 to one saves or 50 to one saves and they'll come and they'll go. And it's not a big deal. So congratulations, you now understand Grace. Like really, that's as simple as it is. Um, obviously, there's a tiny bit more, but like fundamentally, like in 10 minutes, I just explained Grace to you. And, and if you recall your experience learning Git, <laughs> I'm going to guess it took more than 10 minutes. You know, it's a, one of the questions I like to ask people is like, would you rather teach somebody Git or would you rather teach them what a monad is? <laughs> and you got to think about that. <laughs> I'd rather teach them what a monad is, to be honest. Um, okay, demo gods. Uh, I'm going to do a very, a very short light demo, um, just to show you what a little bit of what it feels like. So, um, and I'm just going to show you in, for one user. Um, here is uh, here is my friend Alexi. I just pick. Uh, I'm a New York Rangers fan. I pick uh, players from the Rangers to for names. So here is, um, here's Alexi with the file. Now on the bottom here, I'm running Grace Watch. In fact, I'm just going to do, oops. And here's Grace Watch. Now right now, Grace Watch is a command line thing with a lot of debug spew, early alpha. But here it is running. And here is, right now, I'm going to run um, Grace status. And here's the status of Alexi's um, of Alexi's, uh, oh, it's funny, you know, the, now that the font got, got changed, I'm going to switch to uh, doing this. Give me just a moment. Oops, okay. So we can see the full screen. Um, so here's the status of Alexi's branch right now. So, um, Obviously, I was doing a little bit of testing earlier today. There was a save, a checkpoint. Uh, save, I checkpointed the same save, so they have the same SHA value. Um, it is based on this particular promotion that Alexi, in fact, did. Um, and here was the message from that in main. Here's the main, right, the parent branch that I'm based on. So you can see the status of your branch and the status of the branch that you're based on. Um, back to Grace Watch here. Now, here's Grace Watch. I'm gonna, just going to upload, I'm going to update uh, I don't know, I'm going to update this file, and I'm going to add a comment somewhere. Uh, cool, new version of the file. I'm going to hit save. There you go, files uploaded, new directory version computed, server has all the information. Um, this server, by the way, um, I'm calling it a server. Now, that was, a, that was strangely slow because I haven't done it. Let's do another one just to see. In fact, let's update this comment. Thank you, GitHub. Thank you, Copilot. Uh, I'm going to hit save again. And there you go. Files uploaded, new directory. That's how fast it should be. Um, this server I'm talking to, by the way, is my desktop computer uh, in Seattle. <laughs> so, um, so it's 4,500 miles from here. It's 7,300 kilometers. Um, and, you know, it's pretty quick. It's not bad. Um, so. So that feeling of how quick it is in the background, like that's what I'm trying to do with Grace. It's like automatic. So, so like I'm showing you what Grace Watch is doing, but the truth is you're just in here doing stuff and you're just hitting save and magic stuff's happening in the background. So that version that we just did, um, let's say I like it and I wanna, um, I like it and I wanna checkpoint it. So by the way, let's do Grace status again. You'll notice that previously the save was the CA21 version. Now I hit Grace status. I've done a couple of saves, and now I have this new CD79 version. In fact, if I do Grace refs, I can see all the references on my branch. Um, and again, like 1.7 seconds. Everything's debug mode, and we're a few miles from the server. But like, it's fast. And I'm, I'm aiming for everything to be fast enough to keep you in flow. So. Um, so there's all the things. That's cool. You can see everything you've been, you've been doing. I'm going to do a grace uh, commit. I like this version. I did some tests. SM. 
NDC uh, oh, slow, yay, I don't know, right? Cool, there's my commit. Now the commit, again, everything's uploaded, so the commit's just creating a database record. So it's pretty quick. Um, I like it, I'm gonna do a promote, and this time I'm gonna do promotion four from Alexi. Again, all I'm doing is creating a database record, really. I'm creating a database record and then I'm rebasing my own branch because, well, I am. And now if I do gray status, what we'll see is, I am my, the save I did was that CD79, the commit I did was that same version, the checkpoint was something I did four hours ago, whatever. Um, I'm, the main is now that same version, now I'm based on it. And like this flow is what I'm aiming for. It's just this quick. Like most of it happens in the background, most of it's automatic. When you take an action, I'm aiming for that one to two second window for all the commands. Um, that's the quick demo, that's really what it feels like. And like I said, you already understand it, I hope, right? <laughs> cool. Um, yay. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, I, I, thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't really begging for applause, but thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. After two years, thank you so much. Um, I'll, t I'll totally take it. <laughs> oh my, all right. Well, let's keep going. But wait, there's so much more I wish I had time to tell you about. Um, I'm gonna go through some of this really quick. Um, I'm using SignalR for two-way communication with Grace Watch. So I have that live two-way communication from the server to everyone. I mean, right now, you know, I was showing you that example of Alice and Bob, but what if it's Alice and 20 other contributors in the repo, and those contributors, and what if it's 100 repo people, and what if they're all over the world? Well, now I can do cool stuff like all over the world, I can auto-rebase people. In fact, you can sort of like, like, I don't even know all the features that I want to build on this eventing model that I have. I can't, I'm not the one who's gonna think of them all but I know that I have the architecture to do it. And I know that we can do some really cool things in real time, especially now, I mean, I know that there's like people who are going back to the office and whatever, but there's still a, we're still gonna be partially to mostly remote. And I feel like there's a, there are some interesting ways we can connect with our teammates at the source control level that have never been done before. And again, can't be done in a distributed version control system. Like, like, I don't know what's happening in your distributor. I don't know what's happening in your version of Git until you do a push. But here, I always know what you're doing. Um, uh, with Grace, in an open source capacity, there's no, you don't have to fork anything. I don't, you don't need to fork the entire repo. You just create a personal branch. You own the branch. It could be like, imagine, you know, ASP.NET Core. And all you do is walk up to it and create a branch. You own the branch. They don't have any control over it. You do whatever you want. Um, you could keep that. You could keep your branch private or public. Up to you, visible or not. Um, you can do work in it and do a PR off of it, um, which is not a pull request in Grace. It's a promotion request. Um, <laughs> there, there is no pull gesture in Grace. There's no push gesture in Grace. Um, um, uh, there, I have tested Grace so far on repositories as large as 100,000 files and 15,000 directories. Um, as long as you're running Grace Watch, you still get that one to two second timing, like it just works. If you're not running Grace Watch, then there's a lot of other checks that I have to do when you do a checkpoint or a commit or whatever. I have to, if, you, if you're not running Grace Watch, then I have to check that all the things are uploaded and if I'm walking through 15,000 directories to do it, it'll take a few seconds. Um, with Grace Watch, it's, I know that it's up to date. Um, I've also tested it on 10 gigabyte files. Um, because like I'm backed, because Grace is backed by object storage, like in my testing case, I, I'm, I'm an Azure and .NET guy, so I've been running it on Azure object, on Azure storage. It just works, 10, I mean, I don't think a 10 gig file should be in source control to be clear, but I've tested it, it totally works. Um, uh, I want to build, I have not built ACLs down to the file level, but or I have an idea for how, to, how I'm gonna do it. I want to do it, I think it's super important. Git can't do that. Um, customized branch permission, so that's one where like, let's say on main, I want to enable promotions and tags, but I want to disable saves and checkpoints and commits on main. You should never do a checkpoint or a commit on main. Okay, cool, that's already there. Um, uh, like on your branch, maybe you want to never un enable a promote, because why would you promote on your own branch? 
Um, you can delete versions. So obviously, like I'm deleting saves, so we have the mechanics for deleting versions. Um, unfortunately, we do occasionally all check in a secret. And like I can speak for GitHub. Um, GitHub has worked extensively to create secret scanning so that when you do a push, we see that, oh, you're checking in a connection string or whatever. Um, still, people are going to do that. And deleting that out of Git is a nightmare. Um, uh, in Grace, I'll have a gesture. I don't have it yet, but I'll have a gesture that keeps the audit trail that, that will say, okay, you promoted something with a secret. We want to get, we have to get rid of that version. But here's a thing that says, this version was this SHA value. It was deleted by this person at this time for exactly this reason. So there's permanent auditability. I've really had to think about um, enterprise features, of course. Like enterprises are going to be a big user of any version control system. I'm aiming for that, for sure. Um, uh, file locking is another one. So if uh, Perforce, the, one of the main reasons users still use Perforce is gaming. Like gaming is a big, where there's big binary files. Um, I had a conversation with somebody who does source control at Xbox. And he gave the example of, let's say that somebody's working on Forza. And what they're doing right now is they're editing a track file, like the graphical definition of a track. And their job, their task is to add 10 trees at around turn three on some track. Well. Like, they have to lock that file, because there's no way to merge a binary file. If someone else edits that file, they've just thrown away hours of work. So we have to have optional file locking. I don't want, like, by default, it won't be on, but I, but I want to pro provide it in Grace. Um, as I said, there's a, oops, as I said, there's a simple web API. Um, and of course, yes, it's super fast. And like, yes, it's, it's consistently fast. My, my goal for performance, I, I'm a big believer in, um, in perceived performance. And perceived performance for me consists of two things. Number one, is it fast? And number two, is it consistent? So like your muscle memory becomes, if I type grace checkpoint and hit enter, I know that, that, command, I know that my command line is going to come back in a second, a second and a half. Every single time. That's what I'm trying. That's perceived performance to me. That's what I'm going for. Um, I very much want to build all the interfaces. Of course, I'm building a CLI. Um, I want to build a, I will build a, a Blazor web API, but uh, I'm going to go on record and say, I hate Electron. <laughs> I hate Electron so much. I hate WebView. We all have these first class pieces of hardware, and we're running these second rate apps on them. I just, it drives me nuts. Um, I believe in native apps. I'm going to try doing it with Avalonia. Um, I haven't started that yet. Um, I hope Avalonia will work well. It's, I expect it to. If not, I'll do .NET MAUI. But I will have native apps to include code browsing, to include some of these gestures, to include that time machine-like history view. Um, if we have time at the end, I'll show you a little sketch of that I did. How are we doing? 20 minutes. Oh my god, I have to hurry up. Of course, I'm borrowing stuff from Git. Again, like, I respect Git enormously. Um, I'm trying. I'm really trying. Let's talk the architecture really quick. Um, in case it's not obvious, Grace is a centralized version control system. Um, decentralized version control to me is why we have a hard time understanding it. Doing, being centralized simplifies everything. There's been lots of attempts at making a simple Git or a simple distributed one. By the way, there's a couple of great other projects going on right now. Like If you're interested in source control, you should really check out um, PHUL, P-I-J-U-L is a really interesting distributed version control system based on category theoretic mathematical. It's patch-based. It's a, In fact, actually, a couple days ago, the Stack Overflow uh, podcast did an interview with the creator of it. Um, it's a really nice project. Another one that I really like is JJ, um, and that is com comes from Google. Martin Von Z slash JJ on GitHub. Um, that's a... a I actually know that team. I speak to them a little bit. They're great people. They're trying to do something really interesting and move Google's internal source control forward. Um, really like it. Um, we're friendly competition. I'm, I'm in this to win. Um, um, but I, I just want to point out, like, if you'd like distributed, um, you're not doing distributed today anyway. Like, you're, you're using GitHub or GitLab or Atlassian or whoever. You're doing hub and spoke. You're doing centralized version control. Like, you never push from your machine to production. You always push to the center, and then the center runs some CI, CD stuff, and that's how it gets to promote to production. Like, you're doing centralized version control. You're just using a distributed version control system to do a dance around it. Why? 
And Git will be around for 15 or 20 years if you still want to use it. As I mentioned, you know, Grace is all about events, um, event sourced fundamentally. Um, I really like CQRS. Um, event sourcing goes really well with functional code and a reactive perspective on code. Um, and I do a lot of projections off those. I'll show you a little thing about that in a second. Um, I use the actor pattern. Actors are based on are built into Dapper. I really like the actor pattern. Um, it makes it super easy to reason about everything that's happening. Actors, the, each individual actor is single threaded, but you can have thousands of them running and they scale up to infinity. Um, I like, I use them for event processing. I use them for an in memory, networked in memory cache. They're really great. And you can have multiple state representations for them that last for however long you want. Um, now, Grace is cloud native thanks to Dapper. I'm going to show you a picture of Dapper. Dapper currently uh, supports 110 different platform as a service products uh, and growing all the time. The community is growing, usage of Dapper is growing. I'm really happy about the bet I made on Dapper, like in, in like 0 0.9 or something, I started using Dapper. Um, it, Azure, AWS, GCP, on premises, open source, and containers, whatever you want to use under it. And here's a little picture of it. Um, it, ha it does service mesh, it does state management, pub sub, it has the actors, it has monitoring and observability pieces. You can talk to it from any language. There's SDKs, of course, I'm using .NET. Um, it communicates with any infrastructure. Here's a little example. If you were going to distribute Grace using open source products, well, here's my Grace containers, Grace server with a Dapper sidecar, and they're running in some Kubernetes cluster wherever, and let's say for object storage, I'm using MinIO, uh, something compatible with MinIO. I'm using Cassandra as a document database. I might be using Redis and Kafka for PubSub. I might be using OpenTelemetry with Zipkin for, for monitoring and HashiCorp Vault for secrets. Cool. That's great. That's my open source one. Now, if I'm deploying Grace to Azure, same exact Grace container, same code, same everything, but now the at runtime, I configure Dapper differently. I put Cosmos DB under it. I put Service Bus and Event Hubs for PubSub. I put Azure Monitor and Azure Key Vault. And again, like fill out your picture. Because I'm an Azure guy, I did this. Fill out your AWS picture, your GCP picture, whatever you want. But that's Dapper. It works very well. I'm happy with it. Um, projections. Um, imagine that I have all these updates streaming in, saves, checkpoints, commits, whatever, and they hit the server. As soon as they hit the server, what I do is I'm going to trade some CPU and some disk space for your performance and your UX. So I'm going to do stuff like if when you do commit, I might do a test promotion to see, can I promote? If I find a problem with the promotion, I might let you know. In fact, what I can do today, thanks to large language models, is I might detect a promotion conflict and actually send that code off to a language model to give me a suggestion to give back to you right away. So I don't just tell you that there's a problem. I tell you and give you a suggestion as to how you might think about dealing with it. I might do temp branches. I might generate diffs right away so that when you ask for the diff, they just show up you know, under a second. Uh, CIC, I generate diff. I can do whatever. I can do all these projections off the data I have and just keep the events. Well, again, seven days later, till the end of time, right? I'm keeping, check, I'm keeping commits and promotions. Checkpoints, by the way, like you don't need to keep checkpoints forever. Maybe you keep them for six months, keep them for a year. I don't think you need to go look back on your checkpoints from three years ago, whatever. OK, that's Grace. That's the architecture of Grace. Um, I want to talk a little philosophy and I'll talk programming language. I want to talk about why F Sharp is not that radical. But like, programming language sit on a spectrum from, from imperative to declarative, right? Um, there's like the hardware, there's like tell the hardware exactly what to do step by step. And you know, it's like, I like assembly language. It's really interesting. Um, but then there's the mathematical category theoretic and more declarative. And here's like just a smattering of languages and roughly where they fit on this line. You might agree or disagree with where one, whatever, just fuzz your eyes at it. Um, but there's this idea that um, programming languages can be translated in either direction. Um, in fact, we do that. It's called compiling. When you move from the right side of this to the, toward the left side, that's called compiling. Um, when you move the other way, it's called decompiling. Um, but all I can say is like from age 11 to age 45, I spent my entire life on the left side of this. Um, and I finally got curious about the mathematical side. So why F sharp? Well, you know, C sharp compiles to IL. So does F sharp. It's the same .NET runtime. It's the same everything that you love about C-sharp. It just happens to be there. 
and then it gets compiled to assembly and it runs just as fast. So, so I'm not like an ivory tower PhD. I'm not, I'm really not. That's not the statement I'm trying to make using F sharp. I'm trying to say that it makes my code better. Um, and, and all I'm doing is I'm, I'm like here and I'm just, just doing that. Really, and like being over here just gives me access to some cool stuff. I still have all the stuff over here. I'm not going over to Haskell, you know, um, which is cool if you do, but that's not what, I, that's not what I'm doing. Um, so why F sharp? Um, you know, Don Syme describes it as succinct, robust, and performance. Don Syme is the creator of F sharp. And .NET is very fast. .NET's like unbelievably fast. That's why. Um, it's functional first, but objects are part of the language, and especially if you're inter interfacing with NuGet. Everything in NuGet C Sharp, it's all based on classes and methods and, and uh, inheriting stuff, and well, F Sharp has all that. It's got a great community. Any F Sharp people here? Yay. Um, um, and I just want, like, here's my philosophical statement. I think the industry has just hit a ceiling on quality and comprehensibility with object-oriented-ish code. And I mean like, you know, C-sharp Java, but Ruby, you know, TypeScript. Like there's a point, like for small code base, it's fine, medium code base, it's fine. When you get to a large code base with object-oriented, if you don't make a serious investment in keeping that code clean, you're gonna run into major problems and functional code lasts longer. It really does, it stays clean longer. Um, I mean, assuming you don't do stupid things. Um, uh, I, I want to very quickly about this. I'm going to tell you my story, but I wrote three versions of Grace, like like for my learning curve. The first version I wrote as I was like getting deeper into F sharp and functional thinking. Um, first, I wrote a version of Grace where I ended up accidentally writing writing C sharp and F sharp because I hadn't made the mental leap to functional thinking yet and to composability, and so. Um, uh, so I did that, and then I was like, this is not, this doesn't smell good. Like, this is not what I was hoping to get out of it. So I threw that version away. Um, and, I, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to get into category theory. I'm going to relearn my category theory, and I'm going to moan at all the things. And that didn't work. Um, that made some really awkward code. Um, but I kept, I learned stuff from it, threw that version away. And now the version you're seeing is actually the third version, which is, which is stuck, which is, it's more balanced, it's more practical. And I use objects, I use classes, but I use them very functionally. I think about them functionally. So why F sharp? This is why. And I could like my field report as someone who spent his whole life on the object oriented, you know, assembly side. My field report is thinking functionally gives you better, safer, more beautiful code. Like it really, really does. It is worth the journey to, to learn and it's gonna be painful. It's gonna take a little bit, but, but it's so worth doing. And it's made my, I'm very happy with the code. Um, are there challenges with F sharp? Sure, like serializing and deserializing records is painful. Um, if you add a field to, the, to a record, now you can't deserialize anything you ever saved before. Um, so I, I'm thinking, I still have this. I'm probably gonna switch them all to objects, in other words, classes, but I'm gonna treat them functionally. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to object orient them. I'm just going to use objects and treat them as immutable. Um, there's an interesting one that I would never have imagined two years ago. Um, Codex is the open API model that's underneath GitHub Copilot. Um, Codex is trained on C sharp. It's not trained on F sharp. Turns out that the suggestions I get out of Copilot aren't that great on F sharp. So I use few shot prompting. You know, I actually go to chat GPT and use few shot prompting to to get better things. Um, in F sharp, let's be honest, there's fewer samples, there's fewer, there's less example code, so what's the solution? Work harder, peasant. Um, but it's not that bad, you know, take, once you learn, it's, it, doesn't take, it doesn't take much. Um, so um, I wanna close with a little bit of code. And what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna pull up Sharp Lab really quick and walk you through a little bit of, oops, I have to, do that, and then I can go to Sharp Lab. So, um, so if you ever use Sharp Lab, it's a really cool site. Um, it lets you just type code, it compiles it in memory, and then shows you the decompilation on the other side. So I have F Sharp code on one side and C Sharp code on the other. Um, in fact, uh, oh, whatever, I'm just gonna do this. So, so here's, here's some F Sharp code, here's some very basic F Sharp code. Now, if you've never seen F Sharp before, it's gonna feel a little weird, because like, wait a minute, 
where's the class? You have these let statements. What are, what are they, just floating in space? Like, what are they hanging off of? It feels weird. Um, and what I want to show you is, like, what that compiles to. Well, so, there, so a module, so there's a namespace, there's a module, and there's these lets, which are, you know, definitions of fields or, or functions or whatever. Well, what does that compile to in C Sharp? Well, here's my namespace. Cool. That module is a static class. Static classes are awesome for composition. I'm going to talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, the int value, well, that becomes just a, a property with a get. Again, like .NET is fundamentally object-oriented. The runtime knows classes and properties and methods. Like that's what it knows. So when F# -sharp compiles to IL, it has to compile to that. So F# -sharp translates. Again, we translate from the right side of that diagram to the left side of that diagram. So it translates it into properties. And this function, well, it's just a static function. Cool. Let's add something to that. Um, let's add a regular class. We've seen this is like a class from, from C Sharp. Um, it's got two properties. It's got a create time and a name. No big deal. Um, this is how you say, uh, this is how you say class, public class in F Sharp. This is how you declare a property. And if you look at them, well, they compile to, here's your backing fields. Here's your property with a getter and a setter. Here's your property with a getter. Like, you've seen this in C Sharp. It's no big deal. Um, let's add a little more to this. Let's add a method in that class. And this method, um, well, what, is it, what does it compile to? Well, here it compiles to a void. So this is a public void. This, this is a method you might have on a class in your code base um, where it returns a void, and it just takes in a value and changes something in the, on the object. Very common use for object-oriented code. Um, Lovely, but not composable. Like, that's the problem. And this is what I kind of want to highlight. Let's add a couple of functions to this. Now we're out of the class. We're back in that module, which means that we're in static. We're in a static class. And I'm going to add a functional change name. Um, I wish I could move this, but I can't. I'll just move this over a little. I'm going to add two, um, two, classes, two functions. So there's a change name and a change time. And you can see what they do. They just sort of assign this. You pass in a name and a time, and you take in an instance of that class, and you return an instance of the class. So that, pro that pattern where I take in the thing that I want to output, I take in a type, and I'm going to output that type, and I'm going to do something to that type, that is where you start to get composable code. It's a monad. Don't tell anyone. Um, so what does that compile to in C Sharp terms? Well, guess what? It compiles to a static function on a static class, static method on a static class. And that's how you get composable code. My number one tip for, for anyone is if you want to use C Sharp or Java or whatever and create more composable functional code, start thinking, stop thinking in terms of methods on classes and start thinking of creating static classes with static methods that you use to manipulate your code. And that will get you so far down the road of being composable and testable. Like these functions are super testable. They're pure functions. If you give me the same class and the same name every time, I will give you the same exact result over and over and over. These are pure functions. So what, what, now that I have these pure functions in, in functional code, what can I do? Well, I can compose them. Right? I have this new function called updated my class. And in updated my class, I take in an instance of class and I give it Scott and in then to the current time. And look, composition. Um, and I know this might look weird if you've never seen F sharp or some of the functional languages before, but this style of coding gets you much more repeatable, testable, beautiful, easy to understand code. And, and I've really tried hard not just to make the UX of Grace beautiful, but I've tried as hard as I can to make the code beautiful. Um, I want maintainers to like it too. I haven't entirely succeeded, but I've mostly succeeded. I'm mostly happy with it. Um, I have a few minutes left. I want to show you a little bit of Grace's code itself. Um, let's see, what do I want to show? Let's do, let's do a little bit of validation. So this is kind of interesting. Um, so this is the CLI part. So I want to validate stuff that's on the CLI before I even send it to the server. Now you can't rely on that validation. The server's got to check also. But I just want to like, not let you send stupid stuff to the server. So here's a bunch of things, like when you have an owner ID and an owner name. And by the way, this, if you look at, this, at the status here, I have an owner, an org, and a repository. So Grace is multi-tenant from the start. 
And that's because I'm from GitHub and I've seen some of the pain of trying to retrofit um, uh, uh, um, multi-tenancy. So I just built it in from the start, um, some light multi-tenancy. So here's, here's, part of, here's part of my code from when I was in step two of monading all the things. I monaded all the things here. Um, I have these functions, and these functions, which are validation functions, take in this thing called a parse result, which is the, which is the, the parameters on the command line. And those, com those parameters broken into a structure that understands what they are. And what does it return? It returns a result type. A result is a success or a failure type. And for when it succeeds, it returns the same exact two parameters I passed in which means, again, just like I just showed, it's composable. It's a monad. Um, and when it fails, it returns this thing called a grace error, which is a, which is a special error type I have. Now, all of these functions do the same thing. They all take in a parse result and a parameters, and they return a result of a parse result and parameters or an error. So what can I do with that? Oh my god, I can do bind. Monadic bind. Magic. But like, I know, I know like this is new and if you've never seen it before it looks a little weird but just isn't it beautiful just like looking at that code it's kind of nice it's just like all these things flow and I gave these really nice verbose names to my validations just like you would for a test case um, and like if they fail at any point the whole thing kicks out the error that fails and stops processing that's how that's monadic bind it's really nice. Now, four reasons that, are, that take a few minutes to explain, and I won't. I couldn't quite do it this way on the server side, but I want to show you the same stuff I did on the server side that's inspired by what I did here. Here is, uh, let's see, which function is this? Here's commit. This is, this is grace commit on the server. And I want to validate all the things. I want to validate the owner ID and owner name you might pass in. I want to validate the org ID, the repository ID, the branch ID. They actually, these are actually parameters that get passed in by the command line in the background that you didn't see, but like it does it for you. Um, I want to check, uh, are, are you giving me valid names? Or does the organization and owner and repository and the branch, do they even exist? I want to check all these things. So what do I have here? I have a list of validations. And if you actually look at all of my endpoints, these are web endpoints. This is like the equivalent of controllers and actions. This is a web endpoint. And I just have this pattern over and over again where I have these validations. And what do these validations do? They take in, um, what, what is validations? Validations is the thing that takes in parameters and returns a list of results, really a list of task of results. But, um, and because of that, I can start doing, so, so like I couldn't do the inputs the same as the output here for reasons, but the output's the same on every single one of these validations, which then lets me, which gets me back into functional land, where I can apply functional code to say, just spin through these, and if there's a problem, stop. So like, I just, like, I lo I've really, I'm really proud of this one. Like, I really like this code. Um, anyway, um, there's so much more I could show you. Um, I want to, like, here's, here's some cool stuff with types. Like, I know C Sharp is finally getting this, but this idea of domain nouns or I can rename, it's not just a GUID or a string, it's a branch ID and a branch name and a container name and a reference ID and all that kind of stuff. So like when I'm looking at the code, it's very clear to me what's going on. Um, there's so much more I'd love to show you. So, but time to wrap up. As I said, number one tip for C Sharp programmers, static classes and static methods. Like, just do it. Go home, pick any, pick any uh, a class from any code base you want just for fun, and try to rewrite it where all the methods that, mod that modify state, all the methods that mutate state, pull them out, write them as static classes with static methods, and you'll love what you see. So this is my, like, I believe elegance matters. Like, correctness, conciseness, maintainability in code matters more than getting every millisecond of performance. It really does. And I get most of the milliseconds. Don't get, I don't leave many on the floor, but um, anyway, thank you so much again. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, I'd love your feedback. I want the stars. Star the repo. If you've not starred the repo, I want to know, do it. No excuses. Um, I'm in this to win. This is real. This is not an experiment. Like I, Git will be replaced. Like I'm in this. 100%. Like I want to win this. 
Um, and you know, programming is art and craft. Don't ever forget that. It's all about art and craft. And thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>